I'm Adrian Schneer, Advancement Coach and Strategist, Lawyer and Professor, and you're listening to the Advancement Spot Podcast, the podcast all about academic and professional skills, strategy, and mindset to help you make big moves to achieve a life beyond your wildest dreams. If you're looking to accomplish more and take your next steps with supportive and experience-informed strategies, look no further. Let's get started. Hi, welcome to the Advancement Spot Podcast. I'm your host, Adrian Schneer, and I am so grateful that you've taken time out of your busy day to spend some here with us. I'm so happy to welcome our guest today to the podcast. Today, we're speaking with Evan Babbins, the events and marketing manager. We'll be chatting today about winding journeys. We may think that our journeys are supposed to be linear, but I can tell you that that's not what I've seen in my work. At some point or another, our journeys wind, and that's not a bad thing at all. A winding journey helps us to really think about what we want, what our priorities are, what our goals are, and how they change over time, and they will. So Evan, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so happy to have you here. Why don't we begin with just a little bit about yourself. Provide our listeners with an introduction about yourself and what you do. For sure. So first of all and foremost, I'm a husband and a father. I'm also a Canadian events professional. I've been in the events industry for just just north of 11 years in in really untraditional roles, which I know we'll get into in a little bit a little bit later. I've been recognized on different event industry best of lists, so I've been recognized on Biz Bash's top 250 event professionals in Canada. I've also been on BizBash's list of top new event faces to watch in the industry, you know, and and many more. Amazing. But that's not where you started. No, it is definitely not where I started. Right. So let's get back there. So let's let's reflect on your journey and how you came to this place. So I know that perhaps we can start with a little bit of a look into your professional side of things and then we'll we'll get back to your academic journey. Yeah, that sounds awesome. So my journey started it feels like many moons ago at this point in a way different world than we're currently living in professionally and personally. I started off, you know, DJing. I started off DJing when I was I would say in, you know, grade 10 or so. I was DJing bar mitzvahs and weddings and corporate events. I then moved into realizing, you know, through university and college that, you know, DJing could lead to a real career in events. And so I went into sort of corporate trade show production. And I really, at that point, was transitioning this hobby that I had of music and DJing and partying and trying to make it into a career and trying to figure out how it could become a rational and a viable career. And, you know, I realized that I was never going to be, be a DJ my whole life. And there had to be more, there had to be a bigger picture to DJing. And that's where the corporate event production came from. And so from, you know, DJing and, and producing private events, I went hospitality side. So I went to work for a number of different hospitality companies in the city where I managed the event from the venue perspective. And then from there, I transitioned into corporate event production around internationally, where I produced shows in the US, across Canada, all through Europe and back. Then I went sort of to a different different view of the industry. I went client side, where I worked at Equitable Bank, and I produced all of the events across the country for the bank. I then went to go back corporate production side agency world. And I went to C2 International, an agency that again, produced shows internationally for different clients. And so what that's given me is it's really given me a 360 degree view of the industry, which was in sub in a subconscious level, I was doing all of these things by design to get that 360 degree holistic view so that when I'm producing an event today, I know what the experience is that the venue is per- is facing. I know when I bring on vendors to execute on my project, what they're going through. I know what 
the DJ is going through that's doing an event for me. And I know all these different sides of the industry because I've lived it firsthand. And so it really allows me to be a better event professional with that holistic view than I could ever be if I just just client side my entire career. So thanks so much for providing that sort of really clear bird's eye view of your career path. And I think it's so important to realize that during that journey, like going through that journey, you might not necessarily have had that foresight that this is where this was all going, that you would end up with that 360 degree view that makes you a valuable professional. Yeah, like definitely in my first role, when I, when I went into, I'm going to call my career path when I started in hospitality, in that moment, I wasn't thinking that one day I'm going to work agency side. I'm going to work client side. Like at that point, I didn't even know what agency side meant, right? I didn't know that there was an option for that. So I think it was, it was a series of educated decisions made with a lot of support from a lot of people in my life, but also lived experiences helping to sort of guide my career path and what I learned from one job. I knew I didn't want to experience in the next and I wanted to take the good parts of this job and apply it to the next. And so, yeah, definitely I didn't know what the future was going to be day one. Right. And so and I think that that's so important to just pause on and reflect on for a moment, because so many young professionals, young applicants, students think, okay, I'm going to go to university. I'm going to go to whatever school it is that I'm going to go to. I'm going to finish the program and I'm going to be whatever kind of professional it is that I'm going to be. And that's my trajectory. That's what it's going to be. And that's not how it happens. (laughs) No, definitely not. I mean, like I can tell you that when I was in, you know, it's like, first of all, it's like so crazy that you're asking people to choose their what they think is going to be their career path in grade 10. Like that's just mind blowing to me at at, that to start off. But like, even what you think is going to be your career path. And listen, some people, they have one plan, they execute that plan and it goes amazing. And they become lawyers or doctors or like whatever the job is going to be, it's irrelevant. But I think more often than not, people will have the curves, the zigzags, the non-planned paths that they go down than knowing when you're 16 years old in grade 10, what your career is going to be when you're 50. Like, I, I don't know if that's, I don't think, especially in my world and the people that I'm, that I know and I'm close with, generally that isn't the way it happened. And it's not, but this is the way that every, that people think that it happens. So I want to come back here. But before that, I want to reflect on your academic journey. So take me back even before your professional trajectory, your your career path started. Take me back to when you were in university and what that was like for you. What happened around that time? What were your thoughts? What was what was going on at that time? Yeah, definitely. So it's also, you know, again, it's very much a non-traditional experience that I went through that really, I I don't think, you know, I would be where I am had I done it any other way, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. That's my experience and my lived experience. So, you know, going into university, you know, I really thought I was already DJing in high school. So I thought I was going to do something with, you know, media, entertainment, music. And so that's what I sort of thought what my life was going to look like. I applied for whatever program I could get into with my average high school grades that, you know, I thought was was good enough to get by. I got into McMaster for humanities and York for arts. Probably one of the biggest, I wouldn't say regret because it definitely led to a lot of things that that helped me and that that changed my life was going to McMaster. At that point, I, I didn't, I wasn't in a place that I wanted to live with my parents. I was sort of in that teenage rebellion, wanted to not be around anyone and just do my own thing. So McMaster made sense in that capacity. And again, it, it was probably the worst decision that I made throughout my academic year. I really feel like looking at it now and thinking about it and reflecting, I should have taken a year off between high school and university to mature 
and to really be emotionally and mentally and physically ready for moving away and living alone and and moving out of my parents' house. But that's a side note. Got to McMaster the first year, obviously, was, as for most people, it was a party. It's like you're on your own. There's no rules. There's no curfew. There's no, you know, don't drive the car past 1 a.m. Like whatever your rules are, you have at home. So it was obviously it was a party. My grade suffered. The second when I started second semester, I realized that like, okay, it's time to like buckle down and like have to finish the year successfully to make it to year two. I barely passed the first year. And then I was like, okay, maybe there's something going on behind the scenes that was was stopping me or limiting me for what I could do from an education perspective. But I realized that and we got tested, I got tested. And I, I was diagnosed with learning disability, issues with focusing, with school. And so really, you know, I think after McMaster, I took a year off to work in the industry, in the events industry, to mature, grow, get a handle on things and, you know, get some career experience. I moved back home. And then I went to York and I got into the English liberal arts program. I did two and a half years at York. I thought I would finish York and start working. But again, life had other plans. And I decided that, you know, it wasn't the place for me. I was wasting money. I was wasting my time because I just wasn't, I wasn't ready and I wasn't set up for a university education at that point. So I decided to, you know, sort of bring back the sort of media entertainment side of things inside of my life. And I applied and got into radio broadcasting at both Seneca and Humber. And I chose to go to Seneca because it was a better program. And then after I finished Seneca, you know, I started working and I was working in hospitality and everything else that we were sort of talking about earlier. But I wanted to really continue my education and I wanted to get more out of just having a radio broadcasting diploma. So I got into Ryerson at the, for their strategic marketing certificate program as part of the Chang School. And I wanted to get that marketing education to be able to make the jump from hospitality into more corporate. And I knew that's what I needed to give me that push. And then since leaving Ryerson, I've been wanting to finish my undergraduate degree from myself, for myself. And I wanted to make sure that I knew that I could finish it. It wasn't for a job. It wasn't for a promotion. It was for me to know that I could complete something that I set out to do And however long it takes, and I'm still doing it today, I'm taking one course every semester at through Waterloo online. And if it takes me another five years or six years, it doesn't matter, but I'm doing it for me so I can finish it. So I know that I accomplish something that I set out to do. And I think that's so important. So thank you for sharing that. I And one thing that I want to pull out from this is that you're doing it for your own internal validation, your own internal approval and acceptance of yourself, something that you're doing for you, not for the approval of anybody else, of any job, you're doing it for you. And I think that that is something that is really, really tough, especially when you're younger, especially when we're younger, we're trying to appease those around us with other expectations for for us than we even have for ourselves. And in many cases, that's the reason we go into a program. That's the reason we go, you know, into whatever, you know, professional school or graduate school or other sort of program or a path all entirely. And so one thing that I'm really, really careful of with my clients is that we're doing things that they want to do, that we're taking a path, that we're taking a direction that they approve of themselves, that they feel aligned with. And so I think it's so interesting that it's how long has it been since then? I mean, we don't have to date ourselves, but, <laughs> it's, you know, it's been over a decade. A long I think. time. Yeah. And and I think it's so important that you've gotten to this place where you are doing it for yourself and for no other reason. Yeah, I think like when you start out in your sort of academic career, you're doing it because like your parents want you to go to law school or you know, your grandfather was a dentist, your dad was a dentist. So now you want to be a dentist and you're getting, you know, external forces helping you decide your path. And for a lot of people, that's what they need. And that's the motivation they need. 
And I thought that was the motivation I needed too in the beginning. And then it turned out that it was actually the com- complete opposite. That was where I really needed to be was doing things on my terms, on my comfort level, what I wanted to do. And I've always been like that. I've always been someone who, you know, doesn't care what other people think of me. I don't need external validation to live my best life. And, and I think that it just needs to be, you know, on my terms and on my, when I want to do things, that's when I'll do them. And if it takes a year, five years, 10 years, for me, it's irrelevant as long as I know that I'm doing it for the, for, and I'm going to, I'm going to use a bachelor quote because I'm a diehard bachelor fan, (laughs) but I need to do it for the right reasons. And, (laughs) and it's, it's true. Like, you know, it's, it's true. It's like, I'm not going to do something that I'm, I don't feel a hundred percent aligned with. I don't, I'm not going to do something that's like fake. I'm not fake. I try really hard not to be fake at all times. And it's just, it needs to be, it needs to be something that I can be behind a hundred percent and that I believe in. And looking at both my career and my academic journeys while going through it, I may not necessarily have felt that way. Looking at it now on the back end of things, which I hope I'm on the back end of things, especially from an <laughs> academic perspective, you know, I'm done with school. I'm done with writing essays. I really don't <laughs> like them. But, but looking at it now, looking at the whole path as a whole holistically, it's like, yeah, I made different decisions and I made choices along the way in the moment that may not have been the best choice in the moment, but every choice I made, I backed a hundred percent. And you learned from it. For sure. Yeah. Right? And like, and like, had I not gone to McMaster, maybe I wouldn't have found out that I had a learning disability or that I, that I was di- I wouldn't have never been tested to be diagnosed with ADD, you know? So if I would have gone to York, it would have been a lot easier. I would have been living at home. I wouldn't have been partying as much. I would have been just DJing on the weekends, going to school during the week. So maybe these things wouldn't have come out as prevalently as they did because I was in my own element and I was away from you know, the comfort of home and the structure of home. So like, while it may have been a bad decision in the, in the beginning, I think it actually helped my life in the long run. So like, again, I always look at things from a positive light. I don't want to go too off course on this, but like going through some things I've gone through in my life from a health perspective, you know, as a cancer survivor, you look at things differently. You look at things from a positive light. You look at things that like, and I'm not going to be cheesy and say every day as a blessing, but like you definitely change the way you look at life. And I try to always look at life in a positive light, no matter what the scenario is. And it's true for career, for education, for family, for, you know, relationships in your life. Like I always try to give people the positive side as much as humanly possible Mm -hmm. because of what I've gone through. Yes. So thank you for sharing that. And Only, you know, as much as you want to share, I do have a follow up question. You know, having gone through cancer diagnosis treatment and you can share as much or as little as you'd like, how has that changed how you've made decisions for yourself? Yeah, totally. So I'll just I'll run through this sort of scenario high level. So January 2018 backstory my wife didn't like my GP. She didn't like my doctor. She thought he wasn't giving me the right care. The He wasn't thinking about me holistically and everything that was going on. Her doctor's office was at St. Mike's Hospital. She saw there was a poster that a doctor was taking on new patients. She booked me appointment and didn't even, you know, tell me she was booking the appointment. So January 20, 20th, I think, something like that, I had an appointment with my doctor he did the full physical. He was going checking around my thyroid area. And he was like, do you have any issues with your thyroid? Do you have any family issues with your thyroid? Which I didn't know what a thyroid was at that point. And I said, no, like nothing. He was like, something feels off. I want to do another, you know, let's get an ultrasound, a CT scan. So January 27th, I had the first ultrasound. A week later, I had a CT scan. Three weeks later, I went to go see him again. And he died. And then, sorry, then I had a thin needle. But then he, he came, we came back, got the results. He wasn't still happy with the results. He thought there was something they were potentially missing. I did a thin needle biopsy in February. We went to see him at the end of February. He diagnosed me with thyroid cancer. 
by April 12th, I had seen the surgeon like for a, for a pre-op consult consult April 12th. I had surgery. I was in the hospital for four days. I think it was July of 2018. I had my first round of radioactive iodine treatment where I was in the hospital self-isolated for an entire weekend the following summer. So August, 2019, I had a second round of treatment. And since then I've had no more treatment since then I'm on a one pill every day to mimic my thyroid function. I get regular ultrasounds, regular blood work to make sure that things are progressing positively, which they are. And so that's sort of the the high level of my of my cancer journey. And then thinking about how I think about life differently than before, you know, like I said earlier, it's definitely you think about things in a positive light. Like the doctor told me that like if you're gonna get cancer, thyroid cancer is the one you want. It's very treatable. It's very manageable. So like when I was going through it, that I think I was going to die, that I think I was going to have X amount of time to live left. Like, no, I didn't. It wasn't that I didn't get to that place, which is great. And it was awesome. But I think going through it, especially talking to friends and family and other people, you know, as soon as you bring up the, the word cancer, people assume you're sick and they assume you physically are different and emotionally are different. And I was, the truth was I was never sick. I never had any pain. I never had any sickness that you could quote unquote call it when you think about someone who has cancer. And so it was hard to sort of rationalize people thinking I was sick when I, I didn't feel sick. I never felt physically any different from the moment I first saw my doctor till today. I physically, I don't feel any different. Emotionally, you go through different things and you go through different feelings you know, when you're first diagnosed as a 29 year old guy who is healthy on seemingly healthy, you don't think you're going to ever going to hear those words like you are diagnosed with cancer. And I remember, when, you know, Bailey was in the appointment with me when we heard that from the doctor and we both were kind of just sitting there being like, how can a healthy person be diagnosed with cancer? But you don't know what you don't know. Right. And so I remember my best friend when I told him, I was like, you know, this is the deal. He was like, oh my God, do I have to get tested? Do I have to go to the doctor? Like, what do I have to do? Like, how do I know? Like, maybe I have this too. And I'm like, do you get regular physicals done? Like, yes. Has your doctor said anything before? No. I was like, so you're probably okay. Right. And so it's like, you, you sort of take that mentality and you're like, you channel it for the positive. Right. So you, you it's like, he was sort of asking me all these questions and was like freaking out a little bit more than I was freaking out at that point. And you just like, you put on the the positive side, the positive view, and you try to give people, you know, the benefit of the doubt. You try to, I don't want to use the word deflect because like, that's not what I did. It's not what I continue to do. But like, I just don't want to talk about negative topics. And like, while cancer is definitely a negative topic, it can also be a positive. Like they removed cancer from my body so it wouldn't spread to other areas of my body when it it did spread a little bit to the lymph nodes around my in my neck, but they got it and they cleared it and, and it's all good. But like instead of looking at it from a negative connotation of like, oh no, you have cancer, like you must be sick. I look at it from a positive. Like there was an issue. They removed my issue in a quick manner so it wouldn't continue to spread. I am that much healthier because I no longer have cancer in my body. Mm-hmm. And so And so that's the mentality across everything is like, you look at a job, right? You're like, you know, I had a really tough, you know, talk with my boss and like, you can take that in one capacity as like, oh no, my boss is really pissed at me. And like, I did something bad and, and, you know, be woe is me. Or you can take that interaction and say, you know, there's obviously some form of friction going on. My boss obviously has more knowledge and is smarter than I am and is knows more about this topic, presumably than I do. So I'm now gaining that much more knowledge that I can then apply to my work and make it better. And so there's always different ways of looking at, at different scenarios. And I always look at it from that second scenario is like, again, why, if you think negatively, your life will become negative. And why would you want to have a negative life? And so would it, would you agree that you feel more present in your decision making now? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I I don't think, 
I don't think that that going through cancer and going through medical issues that I've gone through changed my like presence, but you definitely feel a sense of being present in your life and being present in like relationships and Mm -hmm. being present, you know, in different areas of your life when you go through these kind of things than maybe before. Yeah, definitely. I would say so. Yeah. So I would like to take this conversation and I want to just apply it to transitions that you've gone through both academically and professionally. So when you were transitioning between academic programs, how did you feel during those transitions as opposed to now how you feel as a professional as you're going through professional transitions? How does how has that changed for you? Yeah, I think I think when I was going through academic transitions, I definitely wasn't as mature and responsible as I am now. So you definitely think of things and you think of life differently, being more mature. You know, when I chose to go to Waterloo, I decided to make that decision based on like, you know, evaluating different schools and different programs and what I could, how much I could, how many courses I could transfer for I already accomplished to one school versus another school. So you, you really like think about all the things that, that are, that implicate that decision, you know, being more mature, being more responsible now versus when I was, you know, 17 deciding to go to McMaster or even when I went, chose to go to York, like the choice to go to York was simply out of like my parents being like, well, you're not going to sit at home and not go to school the rest of your life. Are you, you know, getting that guilt from, from my parents and I hope they don't listen to this and hear that what I'm just what I'm saying, but that's fine. You've but come it's a like, long way. You've come a yeah, long way. Well, that's the thing. It's like it's like you can really see the difference. You can yeah. really see how your life has changed. That like you're deciding things and you're making decisions. I would say on a more cognitive level now than when you're younger. Maybe you're doing it again because of that external pressure or that external force that's telling you what to do. Where now. Like my parents don't care if I finish my undergrad or not. They don't care if I do another course in marketing or if I, you know, want to go get a PhD in, you know, whatever philosophy, like they don't care. Like they want me to be happy and do what I want to do and whatever. But like when you're 18 living at home under their control, quote unquote, they have way more of an impact on your life and the decisions you're making than they do when I'm 34 almost living on my own with my, with my family, with my own family, they just want, at this point, they want you to be happy. They don't care what you're doing as long as you're happy Mm -hmm. and as long as you're healthy, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that it's really important to talk about those moments in those decisions, in those transitions, because many of our listeners are students going through academic transitions. And so I think one of the takeaways is that it's okay to go through these transitions, whatever they are for you. Like it's okay. And part of the work that I do with my clients is I help them be present in those decisions so that they feel like they are in alignment with the decisions that they're making. And in many cases, I have parents and their kids in our sessions together so that we're all in alignment. Because if a kid, and I think that you, you made a great point is that if, if, a kid is living at home, their parents are quite likely some of the biggest influences on their life and their choices. 100%. And so in many cases, in many, for many of my clients, parents are along for the journey with us. And I love having parents along because it richens the experience for everybody. And it actually improves the relationship between kids and their parents. Because there's this open line of communication that wasn't necessarily there before. Even if the kids and their parents have a great relationship, there's this open line of communication that it's okay if we don't have the exact same ideas about where it is that I want to go or how I want to get there. But there is a way to do it so that we know that we can all be happy and content and successful on the other side and throughout the journey. And the parents... I really enjoy having them along for the ride because they are able to see so clearly the transitions and the the growth that their children experience through our work together. And so I think it's just so important to pause at this 
topic of transitions, whether it's an academic or professional transition, these moments are okay. And more than that, it's okay to be uncomfortable in these moments. The discomfort is really important. Well, that's, I think the uncomfortable side of things is almost more important than the comfortable. Like, yeah. like if you're just cruising and you're comfortable, like I look at it from a career perspective, like if you're comfortable in a job and you think you're invisible, like you should never think like that because like gives me the motivation and it gives me the the drive to keep pushing and keep doing more and keep doing better so that the company has no choice but to keep me and promote me and keep me in the company. And to me, that's professionally, that's my biggest driver. And that's my biggest, you know, motivation is I want that job and I want the next job. I want the promotion. I want to become the director. I want to become the VP. I want to become a C level. And and I know that by pushing myself, that's what and the decisions that I have to make to keep the job, to get better at the job, to move up the corporate ladder in this company or outside, like that's what motivates me. And that's the decisions that I'm making every day because it's not comfort. It's not cruise control. It's you're always on the gas. You're always on and you're always like not to feel like if you get to a place of comfort, whether you're academically comfortable or or professionally comfortable, like it, it leads to complacency and it leads to being in a state of not being motivated to do better and to do more and to grow and to advance yourself in your journey and in your trajectory. And for me, I can't let that happen because I know if I do get to a place of comfort and of complacency, that there's someone knocking on the door to take that spot. Mm -hmm. And I think that the one of the important things to pull out here is that it's about, so first of all, the advancement that you want is advancement for yourself, for nobody else. You're exactly. driven by your desire for advancement for yourself. And I exactly. think that that's important. And that is one of the most powerful motivators is doing something because internally, that's what you feel you want Yeah, at the core. Right. And secondly, I think it's also important that to, to sort of put a, la- a name or a label on what that feeling is. And that's not wanting to settle, not wanting yeah, I mean, to settle. You never want to do that. No, never. I mean, I don't ever, I mean, I don't want to ever do that. I'm sure there, there might be people out there that, that do want to settle and are comfortable in that doing one job forever. Like these people are like 60 years old now. They've been in the same position since they were 25 and they're happy doing that. And like to some mm-hmm. people, you can live a fulfilled life and you can be happy and you can do the same job every day for your entire career. I'm not one of those people and I'm not going to be one of those people because I have the drive. I have the hunger. I have the career aspirations to do more every day. I don't want to be the events and marketing manager in two years. I want to be the director. Mm -hmm. Then I want to be the VP. Then I want to be C-level. Like if you're not on board with that trajectory, this isn't the company for me. And this isn't the place for me because I need to know that there are those options, that there are those available positions to get to. And I'm not saying I'm going to be the director day two, right? I know it takes time. You got to put in the work. You got to put in the energy. You got to show the company that you're who you're selling yourself in the interview process. Cause anybody can say anything in an interview, but it's about putting in the work and proving mm-hmm. to them when you get that job that you can actually do what you said you could do in the interview. Mm-hmm. But if you put in the work, there should be no reason why you shouldn't get those promotions and you shouldn't get those those next level on the rung if you want it. And if you really in your in your soul feel like that's where you want to be. If you want to be a utilities manager for 25 years and never change, that could also be a justifiable, very great life to live, you know? But for me, it's not the reality. And for those of us that want advancement, it's not. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And so typically the people that I work with, the families that I work with, the the individuals that I work with are not satisfied with that sort of with that sort of trajectory. And as you said, there's nothing wrong with it, yeah. but it's not for everybody. It's not for everybody. And so this is why we're called the advancement spot, because we help people advance and advancement never ends. Exactly. Advancement even never a ends. CEO, even the CEO of a company has more room to grow. Like 
Yeah. The CEO is reporting to the board of directors. And if the, the CEO doesn't achieve his goals and the company goals, they're gone. Mm -hmm. And so if I was a CEO of a company, I would be just as hungry and just as motivated because yeah. even if you're at the top of the, the top of your industry where there's nowhere else to go, there is always places to go because you can have like a side gig or you can join boards or be a philanthropist or all these other things that like, if your job is at the top of where you can go and there's no more room for growth in your job, let's say there are other things you can impact your life with that you can have advancement and you can grow and you can be motivated on outside of your job, let's say. And then there's the piece that if that is the case and there is truly no more room to grow in that role in that company, then maybe that's not the right place. Right. Right. Find somewhere where you can grow. Find mm -hmm. someone who, find a company who appreciates the value. And I, I talk about value a lot in terms of career, in terms mm -hmm. of my my industry, you need to be in a place where your value is recognized mm -hmm. and where you can bring value to where there was not previously that value. So if I look at it as like, what value do I bring to the team? What value do I bring to the company? Then how do I convert that into, okay, now what value does this company bring to the industry that we're part of via the events channel? And then how can I take that in the events industry and bring that value and grow myself as an event professional in the industry, bringing value to such a humongous industry? And I think that something that you said earlier is really important because I speak about this actually with my students all the time and with clients as well, is that you said that in your interview, you said, this is the advancement that I want. This is where I'm going. Are yeah. you on board? And yeah. I think that that is so important just to recognize for a moment, because in so many cases, and certainly with so many of my clients, I am the one convincing them that they're, that the company or the firm or the clinic or wherever the hospital, whatever it is, is lucky to have them, not the other way around. Sure, they want this job, but they bring value. And so I think it's so important that you were so able in that circumstance to voice not only your value, but also where you want to take it. And your company valued that. They hired you. Right. And I think, you know, I think it's one point and it's it's half the battle. Half the yes. battle is telling them what you want and telling them what they want to hear and telling them all the great things about you. But then the second half is how you execute. So yeah. for example... You know, you get the job, you get hired, your first day starts on January 1st, start a new job, right? That first like two weeks is what I trademark as the sponge curve. <laughs> and so, and so the sponge curve, for those of you who don't know what that is, is the first two weeks of you're in a new X fill in the blank job, school, relationship, whatever it is, that first two week period is you want to soak up as much information from as many people about that position, that mm -hmm. program, that relationship, whatever you are in, as you can. And you want to take it in like a sponge. And so then once you have that experience and that knowledge, then you can execute. Then you can start to make changes. Then you can start to bring yourself to the table and add the value but if you don't have that information and you don't have that sort of sponge curve completed, then it's almost irrelevant because then you you don't know where you're starting. You don't know what you're getting yourself into and you don't know how you can succeed. But after that's completed and you feel good about it, then you can really make tan tangible change. I love that, the sponge curve. And it's so true. And sometimes it's longer than two weeks, right? Like in many yeah. cases, it's a lot longer than two weeks. Especially for, for example, you know, something that is common among articling students is many have no idea what they're doing for like the first several months in many cases. And I think that this is even true as people continue to advance in their careers, like things are always going to be new. So you always have to be a sponge. I think that the curve is the important part that you're getting at, yeah. that, that at the beginning, there's that steep curve. Right. But you never stop absorbing. Right. Like every time you get a promotion... That there's a new sponge curve that starts. Yeah. Exactly. Every time you, you know, when you go from like undergrad to grad school to PhD, like 
there's new sponges along that yes. journey. Like when you go from like your undergrad to law school, you go from, you know, articling to practicing, like, you know, all these things, whenever there's a new, there's new scenarios that you're part of, you, you find a new girlfriend, you get, become from being a boyfriend and girlfriend to fiance to married. Like there's all, all those things are changing. It's not just career, just educationally. Like I remember when, like, when Bailey and I, when we were dating to when we were fiance to when we were married, like things change and your relationship changes and you're, and you have to like learn how to cope with the changes that has occurred, right? Going from just dating to being fiance, like, like things change and the relationships change and, and there's new factors that come into play, right? When you get married to somebody and you were just fiance before, like you're now part of a new family who you may not have known quite as well as when you're married, right? And you have to now learn how you as a person bring value to that new family and how you fit into that family and how your partner fits into your family and vice versa, right? Mm -hmm. And so that sponge curve doesn't just happen once and then it's done. It's always sort of happening in different capacities. In your personal and in your professional life, in both. Yeah, both. Both. Yeah. Simultaneously mm -hmm. sometimes too. Mm -hmm. Like like you get I like like you could get married and start a new job yep. in the same week, mm -hmm. right? Or like same month. And like, now you have multiple things or you're starting a new job when your wife is giving birth to your kid, like at the same time sometimes, right? And like, yeah, that's a big all sponge. these things happen. That's a big sponge. That's massive, a big sponge. <laughs> massive. But, it, but it's things that we have to deal with and it's things that, that help us move forward and move up positively always. It's yep. never, never stops. That's right. That's right. So- I want to ask you one more question. And that question is, what advice would you give your younger self? I would say a couple of things. Don't be scared of change. Don't be scared of the future. Don't be scared of failure because you only grow from failure, whatever the capacity of the failure is. And again, always be a sponge. I think that that's an amazing place to end. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us here today. And I think that we've all learned a lot about winding journeys, about the fact that it's okay to not end up where we once thought we would, that the end of what we think our road is, is actually just the beginning. And that transitions are okay, they're uncomfortable, and that we need that discomfort in order to drive us forward. And also that being present in our decision making is so important. And finally, being a sponge. Be a sponge, absorb as much as you can all the time and never stop growing, right? Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for listening to the Advancement Spot podcast. If you heard something today that helped you get one step closer to achieving the amazing life you want and you'd like to learn more about working with me, I'd love to hop on a call with you to see how we can help you. So follow me on Instagram at Apply Yourself Global and send me an email at hello at applyyourselfglobal.com. I'd love to hear from you. Remember to subscribe so you never miss an episode, leave this episode a review, and share this episode with somebody you think needs a boost of inspiration and actionable tools to help them succeed. Thanks for joining me and see you next week.